Hello, folks. Welcome back to the Food for the Faithful channel with me, Bill Reimer, your reluctant prophet. It's been a difficult time since we spoke last, which makes it all the more important I speak with you today. Someone on one of the hundreds of social media groups dedicated to freedom from metastasizing government recently posted that they want their country back, along with a small business they lost due to it being destroyed by the government's COVIDian stupidity. I wonder if it is possible that this person should want those things more than I do. I would happily forfeit what little remains of my sorry life if I could be assured that no one will ever again labor under the misapprehension that the state ought to be given the authority to veto the democratic will of its citizens while crushing their economic freedom. I've been predicting the downfall of limited constitutional government for at least 10 years, since the writing of creeping authoritarianism has been on the wall for decades. People are so easily duped into believing that the very government, which is the source of so many problems, can do anything other than cause more problems. After all, our political and bureaucratic class claim that they're the only ones able to solve the very issues which would not exist had they not deliberately caused them. Moreover, they have consistently fabricated authoritarian solutions to address artificial crisis after artificial crisis. We're being governed by this type of madness for the express purpose of fulfilling a limitless lust for power and control. Given that the politicians in charge believe themselves to have a carte blanche right to exercise power over us, we are fools for believing that there can be a political solution to such a moral catastrophe. Yet even as the state herds us like so many unthinking sheep to the abattoir, the most consistently remarkable feature of its response, response to external acts of aggression is to cower in the face of them. This reflects two contradictory things. First, that the radical left sympathizes with their ideological opponents if those opponents are against the same things the radical left detests, namely, liberty under the rule of law, broadly speaking, and Christian values specifically. Second, our radicalized political class consistently refuses to understand others from the perspective of how the other thinks. Rather, they insist on ascribing to radically different cultures the essential leftist belief that we are all born tabula rasa and therefore falsely assume human nature is infinitely malleable. Due to the radicalized political class, due to this, the radicalized political class believes they can mold us into their image by force. And they do so without ever attempting to understand their ideological opponents from their opponent's perspective, which is why so-called progressives insist on promoting cultural rel relativism as an, ins an essential tenet of their ideology. An example of such is that the Iranians and their proxies fully intend to extend Islamic caliphates throughout their own sphere of influence while destroying Israel. This makes a diplomatic solution to the present war between Iran, its proxies, and Israel impossible. But is the progressive West even capable of admitting that the mullahs behind this war of attrition cannot accept anything other than an extension of their tyrannical Islamic caliphates. Israel, for its part, will defend itself with all the might at its disposal. There can be no diplomatic solution to resolve this equation, since from Israel's standpoint, 
It cannot tolerate a regime religiously dedicated to killing Jews while erasing Israel off the map. And the West is smack dab in the middle of an ideological co conflict that cannot be won on the battlefield. People are ultimately what they have come to believe, and belief systems so completely religiously and culturally entrenched are not easily changed, which is why not all cultures are of equal value, nor do they operate under the same set of rules and precepts. In fact, they have rules, mores, attitudes, and idiosyncrasies so radically different from our own that we cannot possibly comprehend how they think or even why they think as they do. It is best not to evolve, involve ourselves in such unwinnable conflicts since we are already indebted to the point that we cannot even begin to service the interest on our current existing debts. Subtitle, A Righteous Cause in Defense of Western Christian Values Here in the West. Ultimately, Western governments have completely forgotten their proper role in society, namely, to defend sovereign borders, maintain the rule of law, while protecting the right of the citizen to live and trade freely with as little intervention from the state as possible. The state is not qualified to predict and control the market, least of all, to play God. The belief in big government here in the West has become a quasi-religion since we have become idolaters, worshipping the creation of the great global Babylon so one must ask, where does the Church of Christ stand on this issue, issue, since it is for freedom that Christ has set us free? The word justice occurs over 400 times in the Old Testament alone. Then once you bring in the related vocabulary word righteousness into the mix, that appears yet another 130 times just in the Old Testament alone. What the Bible makes clear is that justice is rooted in the very nature and character of God. From Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, from the King James Bible, He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. And as his people, we should also display justice also from Micah, chapter 6, verse 8, King James Version, He hath shewed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? In the face of the church's failures, I have not merely become a political atheist, knowing that there cannot be a political solution to a moral, philosophical, and spiritual crisis, I am also forced to declare that I am a Christian denominational agnostic. What do I mean by this? That the atmosphere of what is called a Christian world or professing Christianity is more detrimental to the development of faith than is the unbelieving world. That is, because the so-called Christian world promotes compromise, and compromise has in it disloyalty to Christ and to his word. In the Christian world, you are not faced with what is openly hostile to Christ, since open hostility would put you on your guard and rouse up in you all your power of resistance. Instead, you will find truth owned but not taken very seriously. You are to follow it, but not be too extreme about it. And then, we naturally grow up to the staturally, stature, morally or spiritually, of the company we keep. Which is why the application of go forth unto him without the camp is the admonition in 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those that call on the Lord from a pure heart, instead of remaining in the great house with the dishonorable vessels. 
subtitle Why I Remain Outside the Camp. Obviously, I do not think that society can avert the onslaught of this prevailing political and cultural insanity we are presently witnessing without the body of Christ acting as the salt of the world to stave off ruin. Broadly speaking, Western culture has now become divided into three loose camps. First, we have the political believers who still hope for a political solution to our moral, philosophical, and spiritual crisis. Second, we have spiritual atheists who are fully convinced that there cannot be a democratic solution to the prevailing neo-Marxist ideological possession. Finally, there are political agnostics who just don't care either way and therefore will allow themselves to be herded like so many unthinking sheep through the abattoir of this cultural Marxist revolution. And it is the latter that I fear the most. But without the church shouting out in this wilderness of iniquity for justice, the West will be lost. So seldom do I hear such concerted Christian voices capable of deconstructing the ideological possession which is causing cultural relativism. Few believers are willing to openly denounce the ongoing process of building the globalist Tower of Babel, overtaking national sovereignties to place us under unelected bodies such as the UN, the WEF, and the CCP, etc., that are manipulating sovereign governments so as to gain total control over their citizens. So I remain outside the camp deliberately. There is a clear parallel between Christendom, which consists of true believers and mere professing Christians, and the Jews from the time of Christ, who consisted of true followers of the Messiah, between the Jews who were complicit in crucifying the Lord. In this analogy, the camp represents professing Christians which mostly do not follow sound doctrine. It is solemn indeed that the Christian profession, profession, which started out so well, has degenerated into what it is today. But above all, it must be remembered that the admonition is to go forth to him, Christ. We are not to follow anyone or any other body of thought other than that of Christ and him crucified to embrace our union with him in death and resurrection. It would be good to start with a general principle of separation from evil. This is a complex topic because there are various forms of evil and corresponding degrees of separation. In addition, because we are in the world, there is some evil we cannot separate from. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is an important chapter because it speaks of separation from evil in the assembly and also points out that we cannot separate from all evil, as referenced in 1 Corinthians 5 verses 9 to 10. A person may even feel free to meet with Christians at work or attend a meeting with folks who hold various beliefs without being identified as one who holds erroneous beliefs himself. We should always use every opportunity to be of help to others as long as we can avoid being identified with their errors. Separation is not only a New Testament concept. In fact, it goes all the way back to the first day of creation. In, in Genesis chapter 1 verses 3 to 5, there God separated light from darkness this is the primal representation of the principle we have in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, where the Apostle Paul asks, What fellowship has light with darkness? Israel was to be separate from the nations around them. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2, chapter, chapter 20, verse 7, and verse 26. Their failure to meet their unique witness for Jehovah eventually led to their captivity. Will it lead to ours? Then also, some of them returned for the advent of their Messiah.
They in turn rejected the Lord Jesus. Their unbelief confirmed their position outside God's blessing. Jehovah had declared his people not my people in Hosea chapter 1, verse 9. Yet, in the early church period, there were still Jewish Christians who continued to worship at the temple, even though the Lord stated, Your house is left unto you desolate, in Matthew chapter 23, verse 38. The book of Hebrews was written to these. The apostles called them to go to him, Jesus, outside the camp. The camp here clearly means the worship of Judaism, since they were being called to join the Christian company. How does the church correspond to Judaism? First, we need to realize in this context, the church refers not to the true church or the assembly, but to the professed church or Christian gym. This distinction is based on the observation from the epistle to Timothy. In 1 Timothy, we have in view the church of the living God, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. 15, but in 2 Timothy, we have in view the great house. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. It is in this same chapter that we are enjoined to separate from those in the great house and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those that call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. Verse 22. So the parallel is between Christendom which consists of true believers and mere professing Christians, and Judaism, which consists of true followers of the Messiah, and Jews, many of whom were complicit in crucifying the Lord. In this analogy, the camp represents professing Christians, which mostly do not follow sound doctrine. It is solemn indeed that the Christian profession, which started out so well, has generated into what it is today. But above all, it must be remembered the, the, the admonition is to go forth to him, Jesus. We are not to follow anyone else, which is why I remain outside the camp while declaring the truth as loudly as I can to as many as will hear it. My prayer is that you will also join me outside the camp where we will together go into Christ and Christ alone, even if that means we must meet him in the wilderness. God bless you, brothers and sisters. These are things to think and pray about. I wish you a wonderful and blessed April the 25th afternoon. We'll see you next time right here at the Food for the Faithful channel with me, Bill Reimer, your reluctant prophet.